let's talk a little bit about naval boarding pikes with Drakinifel! Hello! Hi folks, Matt Eason here of Scholarly Gladiator and I've got Drac here with me today, my good friend, and I thought I'm going to talk about a naval object. So what better person to have on screen talking about this, and he knows things about these that I don't, <laughs> um, but Drac himself. Link to Drac's channel below, I'm sure you know him, but if you don't anyway, check out his channel. I should also give a very special thank you to Gavin Locke who left this boarding pike at my house. Because that's the kind of thing that happens at my house. People come around and leave boarding pikes lying around. Yeah. Uh, so this is actually Gavin's um, boarding pike and it has various, um, uh, it's got an Enfield maker's mark and ver an N for Navy and various other things. This is actually an 1897 made boarding pike. Now, if we just go back a little bit, let's get all of this mm -hmm. thing in shot. So in terms of height, that is, if I put my hand up, it's as far as you can reach with your hand, it's about up there, which is what, about seven feet something, isn't yeah. it? Um, so you can see it is uh, about the length of a short medieval spear. Um, we'll come back to the date in a second, because that's very interesting. And if we just look at the tip, you'll see, let's focus on that, you'll see it is triangular. So it is uh, non-edged in terms of it's not going to cut anything, but it is a very rigid triangular lance-like spike um, with langettes, okay? Um, we'll talk about the langettes as well in a minute. So you've got langettes coming down the side, you've got a wooden shaft, it's probably ash, I'm guessing, then a socket, so you've got two langettes that are about seven inches long, then you've got a socket, then you've got a triangular point. And also, if we just look at the bottom, and do this very carefully, um, there we go. You will see that we have like little langettes and a little knob at the bottom there. And we'll talk about that in a second as well. So this is a complete Victorian, late Victorian, 1897 made boarding pike. Now, the first thing to say is 1897, I think to many of you out there, will seem comparatively recent in, in military history to have something as simple as a pike, <laughs> isn't it? But People still had boarding pikes in 1897, didn't they? Yes, yeah, boarding pikes, I mean, even into World War I and on some ships, even in World War II, would still be carrying boarding pikes. Still in World War II? Yeah, wow. uh, it was less common by World War II, but, you know, ships that were World War I vintage that had just had them issued, and but there wasn't any reason not to have them, so they might as well keep them around. Yeah, now, so let's talk about what were boarding pikes for. Now, the oh. obvious thing is, point stabbing people yeah mm -hmm. i mean that's the, that's the most simplistic thing it is clearly it's a spear which has been around since prehistory in terms of how you're going to use it and we'll talk a little bit about cut um, about um uh, pike drill in a second but in terms of how you're going to use it clearly it's for stabbing people but why did they have boarding pikes on ships so it, it's all to do with how you board or defend against boarding um so most people on a ship are going to have small arms um for the majority of the classic age of sail, that's going to be pistols, uh, cutlasses, some kind of sword, maybe muskets, rifles. Sometimes an axe, a boarding axe. Yeah. Yep. Um, but when it comes to, to yeah. when it comes to defending the ship, um, most age of sail ships have what's called a tumble home. So if you go and see HMS Victory, you'll see this. So the, the hull, uh, instead of going vertically up out the water like on a modern ship, the hull actually comes out and then it curves back in. Mm. So if you go broadside to broadside and you're trying to board, there's actually going to be a bit of a gap at the top. Yeah, sure. Um, plus, not all ships are created equal. There are two-deckers, three-deckers, single-deckers, and even you know a French two-decker and a British two-decker might have, be of different heights. So you're, you've got a gap to cross, and it's probably going to be a different height, which means that getting from one ship to the other is the most dangerous point, because you're going to have, even, even in the best case scenario, you're going to have to do a little bit of a jump, you're not necessarily going to do Pirates of the Caribbean flying trapeze artists. So style. I'm imagining <laughs> them swinging on ropes with a cutlass in their teeth and a, and a couple of pistols. That's that just a really easy way for someone to go, yeah, yeah, stab. stab. <laughs> so that's what the boarding pike's for then? Yeah, so basically, when if, if you imagine if you've got you know, a sword and pistol or something like that, you at some point are going to have to make a jump. Um, whether it's a jump up, a jump down, or a jump across. And at that point, you can't really defend yourself very easily and it's a gap. So if you have, primarily for defense, 
if you've got a pike and you're holding it like this, you can you can actually bridge most of that gap. So the guys who are assembling on the other ship to, to board you, you can actually start attacking them before they've come across to you. And whilst people are making that, that leap, you can stab them. And even once they've made that leap, if they have a sword and you've backed off a few paces, you can kind of herd them with, with some of your mates. You can herd them in place and stop them from breaking out across the deck. So in a sense, would you describe the boarding pike as a defensive weapon then? It's better for defense, um, and that's some some of the features you highlighted are you know because of that. You know, on a ship you've got lots of rigging, masts, lines all over the place, other people. So although it's a pike, it's not as long as a, a classic pike because if you did that, you'd just get caught up in things. Mm. Uh, similarly, you've just got the spike and the langets. There's nothing else here because if you imagine if someone, let's say, is trying to come across and then you've got some of the some of the riggings coming down as mount to the side of the ship and you think oh there's a person you stab them through a gap in the netting and you pull it back if it's got wings on it that could get caught mm. and then you're, mm. you're doomed so most boarding pikes will be quite smooth and um and then as we said the same thing for the length the the shaft is usually credited as being slightly thicker than uh, the average land-based one, although that's not necessarily mm. universal, and this is a later model one. Um, although sources disagree on why that is, okay. some some think it's because it just makes it a bit more quarter staff like because it's relatively short. Some think because they're on sea service, the thicker piece of wood is less likely to warp with the sea spray and exposure to the elements. But um, that that's a little bit more of an open-ended element. So just before we go on, I just want to um, go on a slight tangent and just talk about the other weapons that were in use. We'll probably look at these in a future mm. video that Alex and I have been talking about. But, um, so everybody knows the Cutlass, and you've seen Cutlasses a lot on this channel. This is an 1845 uh, model Cutlass, as used in the Crimean War and the Indian Mutiny, uh, this kind of period. They were actually shortened slightly in 1857-58 for various reasons and they were given a slightly more uh, pointy point on them but this is the unadulterated 1845 version which I actually prefer because it's got a bit more length to it 29 inch blades so they're actually not that short this is this blade length is as long as some French infantry officers swords um, but beefier this is a beefy old blade with a very very substantial um, iron symmetrical guard so this is what most attackers or boarders would be armed with, isn't it? So Yeah, there'll be some attackers with boarding pikes. Okay. Um, but as I said, board, boarding pikes are generally better for the defence. Yeah. Um, if, uh, again, if you're going over a gap, um, if you've got a bunch of people ranged right on the on the gunwale or the gunnel in um, nautical terms of <laughs> your opposing ship and you've you've got your cutlass yep. and there's a bunch of guys with boarding pikes going yeah come on then I'm, I'm going to have you then your guys with boarding pikes might let's say you're on a three decker attack your two decker you might be going okay back yeah. back back and you create a space for your other guys to go in because obviously you know, I might be here and there might be another guy like me on your opposite side mm. and if we can drive two or three of the enemy back then you've got an opportunity to get across and as we saw when we were on HMS Victory a couple of years ago there's not a lot of space even on the biggest yeah. ships of the line so by creating a space that you can fight in that's that's as key as anything else because quite often the, there there's going to be a numerical disparity a boarding action where you're the attacker will usually be presaged by the upper deck guns firing grape shot or whatever they can really get that's vaguely shotgun like across the enemy deck hopefully then you're going to have superiority in numbers so if some of your attackers have uh, some pikes and you can clear an initial space you can get dozen two dozen three dozen men across and then they've all got space to break out and mm. cover the enemy deck now the enemy's on the defensive um, I think when a couple of fight camps ago that we did some drill with yeah. boarding pikes and, and so forth and it was very clear as long as the guys with the pikes on the defensive can kind of kettle in the attackers the attack stalls the minute someone breaks through the defense tends to fall apart yeah but the guy who broke through even if he had a sword, was usually only able to get through because a couple of the attackers with boarding pikes were either able to force someone into retreat or take someone out to create that opening. Mm -hmm. So whilst they do have an offensive use, I'd say it's like 60, 60, 40, 70, 30 in favour of defence. Yeah, and, and so just so this is the cutlass. Officers would have a sword, 
uh, which is narrower than the Cutlass, uh, it's more nimble, it's a little bit better for thrusting, but in terms of size, they're roughly comparative, uh, usually the officer's sword is a little bit longer, but the Cutlass is very, very much broader and really a more fearsome weapon, I would argue. We do know that in some situations, officers actually put their swords aside and did use cutlasses um, because for in a rough kind of uh, rough and tumble fight mm. where people are using pikes and boarding axes and stuff like that sometimes you want something that maybe is a bit more like a medieval <laughs> sword and has a bit more cutting power um, and of course we should also mention uh, firearms so this is an Adams revolver 1851 model as used in the Crimean War but um, earlier obviously it would have been single shot uh, percussion lock and then before that flintlock pistols there is some advice in Pringle Green about uh, if you're boarding and you've got your pistol and your revolver, now this is a single shot pistol in this case, he actually says to preferentially use the cutlass and then save your pistol for when you come up against someone who's a bit too tough for you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so rather it was, con but that was not the conventional wisdom. The conventional wisdom was boarders were supposed to discharge their pistol and then <coughs> turn it around so you could use it as a blocking, hooking, parrying aid and then rush in. So you would have caused hopefully some casualties on the enemy side before you then charge in with the cutlass. Obviously that's one way of doing it. The other advice of keeping your pistol loaded until you're in dire need of it and then going, right, okay, I'm going to play my wild card now, <laughs> bang, um, that's one option. When you've got a multi-shot revolver, five shot in this case, that changes the game slightly, but bear in mind, in a boarding action or any other kind of melee, you've got five shots. How many of those five shots are actually going to hit a person? And even if they hit a person, are they going to wound? Are they going to kill? Are they going to greys how many of those obviously how many of those shots are going to miss so you've only got five shots with this thing so obviously having hand weapons is still important um, I think one of the questions that would come up is if boarding pikes are so potent and they are in attack or defense you know spear versus sword we've dealt with this many many times why didn't everybody have boarding pikes well, it's partly because um, again as we found in, in the drill but also just generally some, if you have something like a boarding pike on a ship, one man alone in the kind of swirling melee with lots of obstacles and, and things can get isolated and cut down pretty quickly. Or just caught up in the, you know, yeah. against mast or rigging or... Yeah. yeah. Um, so once you have two, three, four, ten people with boarding pikes, it significantly multiplies their effectiveness. Mm. But to, to retain that effectiveness, they have to stay relatively static in terms of what you'd be doing in a naval boarding action. And if you're relatively static, you're inviting someone over the other side with a swivel gun or a 12 pounder to just go, right, well, that'll be, uh, you know, some, some grape shot and wipe out a dozen men in a single blast. So you have to you have to kind of you've got this bit of a paradox with naval boarding pikemen if you like of you have to stay on your toes whilst also staying close enough to the other pikemen to to be somewhat effective uh, because if you get isolated i mean yes you've got a reach advantage but in the very con the very con effectively congested terrain of a ship mm it's not hugely difficult for someone with a with a pistol and a cutlass to get round you. And if you imagine range. something like a rugby scrum or, you know, where you've just got a big pile of people leaping on top of each mm. other, obviously the pikes have the advantage at the first contact because of their reach, because they can hit at a distance where the swordsman can't hit them. But once everything gets into a big heaving mess, I think there's a point at which the cutlass becomes a much more effective weapon, a versatile weapon mm. than the pike does. So I think they have strengths and weaknesses, but moreover, the most effective solution, therefore, is to mix them together, isn't yeah. it? So if you have people with boarding pikes and people with firearms and people with cutlasses, and this is actually very similar to what we see in World War I. So there was an evolution of trench raiding tactics, and by the end of uh, World War I, every, every side in, engaged in that war had got very effective at raiding trenches, and they had one guy with grenades, they had a couple of guys with bayonets, they had one guy you know, with a pistol. They, they had a team that all complemented each other's strengths and weaknesses. And I think that's probably what we see in these naval, whether it's defensive or offensive, they're giving each other's, they're sort of filling each other's weaknesses, yeah. aren't they, to yeah. an extent? Yeah, and it, it, I suppose the other thing when, when it comes to um, this kind of thing is, 
when if you imagine that you're you're your your average pikeman and you're you know adv let's say advancing in onto an enemy ship um, you don't necessarily know where defenders are going to come from. It's very unlikely they're going to come up from below decks uh, because that's they're far too easy to cut down. Um, it's a very obvious access point. But on most ships for most of the Age of Sail, you're going to have the forecastle, which derives from four castle. Mm -hmm. um, in, if you're talking about an Elizabethan galleon, it literally is a wooden castle with multiple decks ahead. And what was either the after castle or the stern castle, nowadays it's the quarter deck, and these were fortified readout positions. But if you're the pikeman, so you've, you've come across the side, okay, so there's enemies ahead of you, so going horizontally, they will then fall back. If you, if you take the middle, mid part of the ship, they'll fall back fore and aft. So now there's an enemy that way, there's, an en there's enemies that way, they may sort you out of those. If you're a pikeman, you're like, okay, well, I'm now gonna face the stern, it's going to take a reasonable amount of effort for you to swivel all the way round to if they sally from the for forward part of the ship. And as you mentioned earlier, with masts and rigging and so forth, so if there was a mast here and I'm like, okay, I think someone's coming from the stern. Oh, they're coming that way. Well, I, couldn't, I can't do this. I kind of could do this, but maybe I'll snag it in something. And it's, whatever the case, it's still a relatively long, relatively hefty weapon. Mm. So it's going to, it it's puts you at a little bit of a disadvantage there. Whereas you with the cutlass, if someone said, ah, oh, they're behind you, spinning around and protecting yourself immediately is, is pretty, pretty easy. Yeah. Um, so I think a couple of other points we should, before we finish up, we should mention that are important to know about the boarding pike. We've mentioned that they were kept on ships right the way through the 19th century and into the 20th century quite commonly in uh, up until World War One, and in some cases even until World War Two. And you've got to bear in mind, we often think about great military engagements like Jutland and stuff mm -hmm. like that, but a lot of the Royal Navy, for example, was out in the colonial world dealing with high seas kind mm -hmm. of, you know, piracy type things, much like the Royal Navy does today, where they might be doing kind of more old fashioned role, you know, basically yeah. policing, coast guarding type stuff, where sometimes you might be coming up against a group of people who they've got firearms, but they might try and board you and mm. try and slit your throats with knives. So things like cutlasses and boarding uh, pikes are very useful in that environment as well. When you bear in mind that firearms, even by World War One, yeah, you've got a Webley revolver where you've got six shots and you don't have any time to reload. So yeah, and the other, the, I think the other two things to point out, one is a really small point, which is trying not to spear things. Um, <laughs> you pointed out earlier, there's no spike on the bottom. Um, that is ostensibly because the first boarding pikes that were issued to ships, they did have them, and then everyone's doing pike drill, and then you finish, you do this, and then the captain's looking down at the deck, and they're like, great, my deck now has loads of holes in it. Um, <laughs> which, I mean, it doesn't look nice, but also when you're at sea, if you have a bunch of you know, feral poked holes in your deck, that's where water's gonna accumulate, that's where rot's gonna set in. Um, so uh, supposedly they then took them off, and, uh, <laughs> And that, so you just have the wooden base, so but you have this to obviously hold it together. Yeah, so, so an interesting thing about the storage. So you have to um, bear in mind there are essentially two ways that cutlasses were stored on board ships as far as I've seen. One was way, uh, in kind of racks, sword racks, a bit like you see in my study. Um, and the other way was up in the, essentially the ceiling, what a landlubber would call it. The, what would you call that in a ship? I don't know. But the, 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 the next deck. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The underneath of the next deck. So you actually have racks above your head with cutlasses in and you have racks along the side with cutlasses in. Same with firearms, you get muskets and even revolvers and they also had sort of pedestal like objects with revolvers mounted in and pistols mounted into them. But pikes, as far as I've seen, were stored in two main ways. They were sometimes st stored flat and lengthwise, kind yeah. of on decks or sometimes below decks. Mm -hmm. Or in long crates sometimes. Yeah, yeah, to protect them. But also, like very careful, yeah. gingerly do this, yeah. Imagine your mast, you're standing on board your ship rocking and rolling and you've got your mast going up here. Pikes were stacked around the edge of that mast, weren't they? And yeah. that's why, if I just come to the camera and show you for a second, if I show you on the end of there, you'll see it looks like a little round peg or knob uh, with the metal ferrule ending there. And one of the reasons for that is so that it goes in a hole, doesn't mm -hmm. it? There's li so literally around the bottom of the mast, there's lots of little holes, you mm -hmm. plug it in there, it clips or loops into something, and you can still see them if you go to Portsmouth today and visit the Victory, you can see the boarding pikes yeah. wrapped around the thing. Yeah, and then the other important thing to bear in mind is that although they're called boarding pikes, the Navy, especially the Royal Navy, but most navies, 
for the majority of the age of sail and then into the 19th century, they also do a lot of stuff on land. Mm. Um, so naval brigades are a huge thing in the Victorian period. Um, if you want to go back to when the Royal Navy's questionably the Royal Navy, questionably Her Majesty's piratical service, the area <laughs> of Francis Drake, um, when they're landing to do raids. So in the 1500s. Yeah. And, yeah. and everything in between where it transitions from just smash and grab to smash and grab and plant the flag. Um, when you're fighting on land, you know, having a, a pistol and cutlass is all very well when you're on a ship, but as soon as you go ashore, the enemy might have cavalry. Yeah. Um, and if they have cavalry, you want something nice and long to poke at them. And the other thing is a lot of the time when you mentioned you know, your, your single shot pistols, if it rains, and mm. there's a lot of Royal Navy operations in the tropics where it tends to rain quite a bit, if your powder gets wet and then the enemy show up, you're in a lot of trouble, whereas you, you, you know, rain isn't going to stop a pike working. <laughs> the, the other thing to mention as well is the naval versions of long arms, uh, muskets essentially, muskets and later rifles, are often shorter. Mm. So if you look at the, the, the two-band Navy, Enfield Navy rifle, for example, it, it has, it's two-band rather than three-band because it has a shorter barrel for use at sea. Therefore, if you fit your bayonet to it, it is a shorter overall object if you are on land facing cavalry or something like that. So um, for that reason, they actually later on issued cutlass bayonets <laughs> to try and make up the length. So you have an immensely long bayonet on your shorter long arm. Uh, the final thing I wanted to, uh, to mention was drill. Yes. Um, so many of you watching this channel will know that Victorian era sailors were drilled extensively in cutlass drill and they used to spar with single sticks a lot. They were trained to use these a lot. But I think what a lot of people don't realize is all the way through the 19th century and into the 20th century, they drilled with pikes, didn't they? There yeah. was pike drill. So when you mention pike drill, a lot of people think about 17th century, um, you know, uh, cu cuirass and helmet wearing uh, pikemen marching around in the uh, Thirty Years' War or English Civil War. Um, but they were doing that with pikes even in uh, the First World War period, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the last boarding action with cutlasses is supposedly HMS Cossack boarding Altmark in World, in World War II, mm. um, but that's a boarding action. Um, there were a lot more ships that still retained melee weapons as drill weapons mm. um, in into the Second World War. So, you know, fortunately there weren't too many major ship-to-ship -ship boarding actions. Um, there were quite a few hand-to-hand -hand kind of boarding actions amongst the small craft that fought in the channel, so the German S-boats and British MTBs and MGBs. Mm. And we know there that, I mean, obviously there was a lot of um, revolvers and such in use, mm. but we do know that the, it, there was also a fair bit of melee combat. Um, now, I wouldn't necessarily want to scramble onto the deck of you know a 20 or 40 foot motorboat in the middle of the channel whilst trying to wield a, a pike two-handed. <laughs> uh, I might probably go for you know something that's single-handed, so I don't think that we're really using boarding pikes in that environment, but you will still occasionally find pictures of ships in the 1930s and 1940s conducting drill and somewhere, either in the formation or off to one side, you'll see a bundle of pikes. Yeah. So, uh, there we go. Hopefully that's given you, if you didn't know anything about boarding pikes, you now know a hell of a lot more than you did 10 minutes ago about boarding pikes. <laughs> um, there's probably more that we could say about boarding pikes in the future. I will also, uh, just a parting thought um, on Gavin's lovely example here from 1897. Bear in mind, this is from 1897. It's not that long ago, okay? We're only, what, uh, 17 years before the First World War. And yet this is still fundamentally, in all practical terms, exactly like pikes, or half pikes rather, due to the length, from the 17th century. You know, it's got a triangular rigid point, it's got langettes, the langettes are there partly to make the attachment to the shaft stronger, but partly to protect against cutlass cuts, okay? They were still expecting to use these things, even though it was incredibly rare and they recognised at the time, they were still expecting to use these things. In 1897, they were still making them in arms factories in 1897, and they were still being stuck on ships. Um, in a period, I think, when most of you don't think about a medieval weapon like a pike being on board a battleship, but there we go, they were. Drac, thank you so much for joining me for this video, and thank hopefully you. we'll see more of you again soon. Yep, definitely. Cheers for watching, folks. Bye. <laughs> Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.